Hello, I'm Gretchen Murphy from the University of Texas, and I'm here with R.J. Boutel. Um, he's the author of The Race for America, Black Internationalism in the Age of Manifest Destiny. Hi, R.J. Hi, Gretchen. How are you? I'm good. Good. Well, um, thanks to the National Archives, we're here today to talk about R.J.'s book. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll just get us started by uh, by saying, um, you know, your book looks at Black internationalism in the U.S. in the 1850s, and it shows how it took shape through Manifest Destiny, um, the ideology of Manifest Destiny and the, the way that it was uh, playing a role in the culture at the time. So just say a little bit about, um, you know, how do you see Manifest Destiny as connected to Black internationalism? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you to the National Archives for having us today. Um, so Manifest Destiny is an, an ideology and a discourse that emerges in the mid-19th century. And part of what it is doing is as the U.S. is starting to gain a sense of itself as a nation and starting to gain a kind of confidence as a nation, um, Manifest Destiny provides a script that sort of explains how the U.S. has come to become a very um, strong international power, and it sort of charts this future for the U.S. So as a discourse, Manifest Destiny um, is explicitly Christian. It says that God has chosen a specific group of people to um, that have been religiously persecuted and have been sent to a new place that is the new world. And in the new world, they're going to perfect civilization. They're going to perfect government. They're going to perfect society. They're going to perfect culture. Um, and as a result of this kind of ideology, what it ends up doing in the mid-19th century is authorizing and justifying the U.S. starting to expand, often violently, into the Western territories, into Central America, into parts of Canada. Um, and as this expansion is happening, um, there are lots of other questions about our identity as a nation that are coming up as a part of that, um, including where slavery fits into our identity as a nation. Because one of the interesting things about Manifest Destiny that I argue in the book is that it tends to get whitewashed, whitewashed as being about a kind of national exceptionalism, as about a kind of US exceptionalism. But when you go back and read the actual texts in which Manifest Destiny is described, it's explicitly a racial ideology. It's about how Anglo-Saxons um, are a sort of chosen race and a chosen people um, who, because of their racial superiority, are designed to sort of shepherd the rest of the Americas into this new era, this sort of millennial era in which um, society is going to be perfected. So for Black people in the United States, it's very difficult for them to see a place for themselves in those kinds of rhetorics, at least on the surface. What I show in the book is that as Manifest Destiny starts trying to describe the United States relations to the other places in the Western Hemisphere, um, whether that be um, in North America or whether that be in um, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, um, Black people start to take advantage of those discourses in order to articulate their own relationships to um, people outside of the U.S., um, specifically Black people, but also other people of color, um, Indigenous people, um, and uh, European people that have settled in places outside of the Americas. Um, so in this period in the 1850s, what we really see is these two worlds kind of colliding and coming together um, and being interwoven in these really interesting ways. So a, a particular flashpoint in my book is the, um, the U.S. invasion of Mexico, the U.S.-Mexico War, uh, which concludes in 1848. Um, after that war, the U.S. Um, forces Mexico to cede a large section of Mexican territory to the U.S., and the U.S. meaningfully expands for the first time since, um, since really the Louisiana Purchase on, on a kind of a large scale. So for proponents of Manifest Destiny, this is kind of evidence that the project is working, that the United States is becoming this great nation, um, that we are expanding, that we are growing, that we are going to spread our particular version of republicanism throughout North America. 
Um, but expansion at this time is also an issue that is um, very much tied up in the question of slavery. Any new territory that was uh, incorporated into the United States, we had to decide whether it was going to be a slave state or a free state. Um, and as a result of that, in things like the um, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, and then in the Compromise of 1850, we see these um, changes that uh, at once sort of validate the project of Manifest Destiny um, as far as its proponents are concerned, but also start to make Black people in the United States really pessimistic about their future in the United States. Um, the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, which makes it um, the case that any person in the United States was forced to comply with the laws of slavery and would have to um, assist in the restoration of uh, refugees from slavery who had run away from slavery, would have to assist in helping their enslavers recover them. Um, that sort of catalyzes this massive wave of migration from free Black people in the North who all of a sudden no longer feel safe where they've been living in the North and decide to flee even further North to Canada or to start to look for um, other places in the Americas or even outside of the Americas to settle. Um, there's a real kind of turning point in terms of their, um, their pessimism about um, whether or not slavery is ever going to be abolished in the United States and whether or not racial prejudice is ever going to be abolished in the United States. Um, yeah, and yeah, Liberia is kind of a, a starting point in the book. Your first chapter is looking at uh, black folks who are who are going to Liberia and the colonization movement and and emigration, um, and you really feature like a range of of black thinkers in the book. Um, but in in my opinion, some of them really offered a much better model of black internationalism than than others did. Um, so in your your first chapter about uh, Liberia, there's a Reverend Daniel Peterson. Um, a, a black black reverend who uh, raised money and uh, you know went to Liberia not for very long, just a few months, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but um, with the intention of promoting emigration as a project, um, but he didn't stay. He went back and then you know published a book about it. Um, and it, you, your account of it really does not present it as a as a triumph of of black internationalism. Um, yeah, you see a lot of flaws in it. And, you know, one of the flaws is even just, I think, almost symbolized by the title that he that he gives the book. He calls it The Looking Glass and really mm -hmm. kind of suggests like he's, this is a mirror to see himself in. But is there, you know, something outside this like line of difference or, you know, another that he's that he's not seeing? Um, maybe, you know, that that he wasn't really able to see, you know, what was going on in Liberia and what um, the uh, lives of the Africans living there were like and what uh, possibilities there were that that he was sort of overriding in um, in thinking about it, in, you know, in terms of himself. Um, so just thinking about that as like a starting point, because um, I, I think it's interesting that you, you know, you don't spend a lot of time critiquing it, or I think that your, your critique is always sort of balanced by thinking about well, what else is he accomplishing and how is this also mm -hmm you know, an important starting point for Black internationalism instead of something that we would write off or discount. So I just wanted to see if maybe you could spend a little little time talking about the specifics and, you know, give us a little bit of this, these um, interesting figures that are at the center of the study. Yeah, absolutely. And and Peterson is such a complicated figure. Um, and, and I really try to approach that with, with nuance. Um, so the the colonization project really begins in the 18 teens um, where uh, philanthropists and fundraisers from the United States, um, white philanthropists in particular, um, collect a bunch of money and purchase land on the west coast of Africa to create a colony um, that they want to sponsor um, the relocation of free African Americans from the US to Liberia. This is sort of a, um, a proto back to Africa movement that is sponsored and organized by white people and is seen as kind of like a third way of resolving the issue of slavery in the United States, right? So rather than abolishing slavery outright and rather than allowing it to perpetuate, 
um, kind of slowly eroding the institution by slowly sponsoring Black people leaving the United States. So the, the height of this movement is really kind of the 1820s, and then it sort of um, really loses steam. Um, although uh, colonizationists do effectively um, create the colony of Liberia, um, there are uh, a number of Black people who remove to Liberia from the United States. Um, but with that turning point in the 1850s um, that I was describing a minute ago, there is this renewed interest in, um, in Liberia. And at this point, Liberia is an independent republic. They declared their independence in 1847. And part of what that helps to do is it allows Black people in the United States to see Liberia a little bit differently. So they're now no longer viewing it as this kind of puppet state by the American Colonization Society, but rather a fully independent Black government where they could actually go and participate in a nation-building project um, where they would be in the majority and they could define citizenship the way that they wanted. So Peterson is part of a wave of, of free Black people who travel to Liberia um, with funding from different colonization societies in the early 1850s. And he goes there and he's enthusiastic about the project. And he, um, he describes Liberia as a very successful young republic. Um, but in doing all of this, he's really validating this idea um, that Liberia was going to be the beginning of a kind of extension of manifest destiny in Africa, a kind of black manifest destiny in Africa, where African Americans from the US who had learned about republicanism and capitalism and um, Christianity um, while in the United States could then import and bring all of those ideas and ideologies with them to Africa and therefore start kind of colonizing and civilizing um, indigenous Africans. So it becomes this sort of expansionist project um, that people were imagining in Africa that Black people would be undertaking as kind of this extension of U.S. empire. And Peterson seems to be all on board with that, right? When you read his, when you read his autobiography, he talks about um, how there are opportunities for Black people that in Liberia, that there were not in the US, that um, uh, indigenous Africans um, are in desperate need of Christianity and, and civilization, and that um, African Americans from the US need to bring that to them. Um, What's fascinating about the colonization movement in this moment is that it hinges on this idea that Black people in the United States have been successfully Americanized and are therefore able to go somewhere else and sort of Americanize people there. And one of the things that Peterson's autobiography demonstrates is that if he has already successfully been Americanized, then he doesn't need to go anywhere else. Um, and he very importantly argues that he has kind of checked all of the boxes of what it means to be a U.S. citizen before he ever leaves to go to Liberia. Now, with that said, he still sort of validates the project of colonizing Liberia. And he has these really um, just, you know, frankly, gross and condescending descriptions of um, the people of Africa in, in which he describes them in the kinds of ways that we would expect a white anthropologist to be describing um, people in, in Africa. So we can see some of the ways that he's internalized some of the ideas that are um, undergirding manifest destiny, these things like US exceptionalism, this thing, these things like this kind of Christian nationalism. Um, and it ends up putting him in this strange position where he is arguing for the capacity of people um, of Black people to be incorporated into the U.S. nation as citizens, but also saying that um, while some Black people still should probably go to Africa and help to colonize Africa, I'm just not one of them. Um, so yes, so Daniel Peterson's a really complicated example of um, how we see these discourses um, kind of colliding um, and the ways that um, Black intellectuals could kind of um, break down and remake or sort of borrow components of Manifest Destiny, but um, in doing that, they're still sort of um, bound to some of the um, uglier parts of Manifest Destiny.
as they try to imagine alternatives. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, there's a, kind of a phenomenon that that I um, encountered and wrote about when I was writing about um, African-American soldiers fighting in the Spanish-American War. Um, and I, I think you kind of sum up the problem as the question of, of how does the U.S. achieve a sprawling empire designed to colonize and assimilate uh, people without compromising the very whiteness that purportedly underwrites its authority to civilize and assimilate these others. Um, when, when I was looking at this problem, I called it uh, shadowing the white man's burden. Um, to mm -hmm. shadow can mean to kind of follow, uh, but it can also mean to, to color something, to make it uh, no longer um, this, this uh, mythic whiteness. Um, and, you know, I sort of found that um, in, in writings by Black soldiers in the Philippines, African Americans kind of had the capacity to challenge and undermine um, what you call the geo-racial logic of this Anglo-Saxon manifest destiny. Um, they can they can kind of undermine it whether or not they're supporting imperialism or challenging it, right? Like the mm -hmm. you know ex explicit content that's supporting imperialism still has this like subversive element if the colonizing project itself is depending upon this neat binary of black and white working in a certain way along the lines of empire. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's interesting that you know when you're rooting this in the 1850s um, and thinking about this as sort of an origin point for black intellectual history, um, you know, why this problem is sort of so important for um, this 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 moment in the emergence of of black internationalism. Yeah, it's it's such a good question. Um, and I think one of the ways that that I would approach that is to sort of turn to somebody like um, Martin Delaney, who, um, for instance, says, OK, if this is how you're defining U.S. exceptionalism, if this is how you're defining the sort of greatness of the United States, if this is what you're describing as kind of the basis of um, of what makes the U.S. this nation that has this manifest destiny that it's going to accomplish, um, I can demonstrate how Black people in the United States also check all those boxes. Um, so in a very famous um, speech that he delivers at the 1854 um, National Immigration Convention, um, Martin Delaney basically talks about how the greatness of the United States and all of the things that are supposed to be great about the United States are really um, the products of Black culture in a lot of ways, right? That the kind of economic power that the U.S. has is based on um, agricultural innovations that came from enslaved Africans who, um, in places like South Carolina, for instance, the rice industry um, that uh, gets built in South Carolina and ends up making South Carolina an incredibly rich colony is based on um, West African agricultural practices. Um, and the whole system for growing rice um, comes from African knowledge. Um, Delaney points out that a lot of the sort of mining practices and other kinds of agricultural practices, all of these owe to African American ingenuity in addition to African American labor. So he kind of points out that we have as much right to claim this manifest destiny as anyone else. Um, and then you have other people like James McCune Smith, who sort of attacks the kind of racial basis of of manifest destiny to show that um, Anglo-Saxonism is a is a social construction, right? Anglo-Saxonism is not a kind of real and meaningful uh, biological designation, um, and it is it is just kind of a history and a story of a group of people um, that are themselves a recombination of a lot of different groups of people. Um, so, in his writings about Central America, for instance. Um, he talks about the importance of diversity as, and multiculturalism and the sort of preservation of diversity and multiculturalism as a way to um, sort of continue the kind of ingenuity that is necessary to realize a manifest destiny. Um, but in doing so, he basically demonstrates that what we understand as race is a, it's a fiction, it's a social construction, it's not 
real and to assign meaning to it as if it's real and to build foreign policy um, and to build um, uh, a nation on the idea that it is and to move forward as if it is, is ultimately going to undermine the project of advancing and progressing civilization. Um, so these are some of the kind of subversive ways that Black intellectuals are jumping into these discourses and um, and sort of taking what's useful and throwing away what's not or using aspects that they strongly identify with to illustrate, illustrate problems with other aspects of Manifest Destiny. And you get a lot of these kinds of creative recombinations. And I, I ultimately end up describing this as a kind of uh, a counter history because so many of these projects that the Black intellectuals that I look at are imagining are speculative or their fantasies or their proposals. These aren't things that are often actually physically realized. Um, but the fact that they're not realized um, is, is not a reason not to study them because it gives us um, alternatives to think about how what ended up happening um, in the 1850s, what happens over the next 50, 60 years when we try to tell that story as historians, um, it ends up uh, seeming like everything that happens is inevitable. But when we go back to the 1850s, there's a lot of different ways that um, the Americas could end up developing um, that are based on a lot of, um, you know, going left rather than going right, or, um, you know, taking this turn instead of this turn. And in going back and looking at some of those paths that we didn't go down, going back at some of the, looking back at some of the paths that Black intellectuals imagined that um, we never ended up going down, we can see um, kind of alternative trajectories of history that can help us to um, reconsider international relations and continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw a strong strand of like utopian thinking in in, yes. in their planning yeah. with utopian sort of meaning, you know, here this um, this capacity to imagine otherwise and think about, yeah, what what other possible shapes are there for uh, relationships between uh, these different kind of nodes in the new world and communities that could be created there. Um, yeah, there's a James McCune Smith uh, writes under the pen name Communipaw, and and you sort yeah. of uh, show that that is a way that um, this this idea of this kind of utopian imaginary, this like counter history of a of a different America is being brought out because it's the title of a Washington Irving story about what a, a sort of um, multiracial uh, colony that uh, was ultimately displaced by New York. Can you say mm -hmm. more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as part of his kind of um, sort of uh, folklore stories about early New York, um, kind of prior to um, uh, English colonization of, of New York, the development of, of New York City in particular, um, Washington Irving is writing about this community up there before called Communipaw. So um, the, the Black writer James McCune Smith in the 1840s and 50s, when he's writing for Frederick Douglass's paper um, in the 1850s, adopts this as his pen name. Um, and that was always really interesting to me, why he chose that as his pen name. Um, and uh, McCune Smith sort of cheekily refers to himself as a descendant of Communipaw. Um, and uh, when I was reading McCune Smith, um, these essays that he's writing for Frederick Douglass paper, he writes this review of a, um, uh, an ethnography about Nicaragua by the, um, the white anthropologist E.G. Squire. So E.G. Squire is this um, anthropologist who travels to Nicaragua um, and writes this you know, 900 page study of, of the Nicaraguan people and culture. Um, with the explicit purpose, because um, he's also a diplomat from the United States, and he sort of is sent to Nicaragua with the explicit purpose to um, get rights from the Nicaraguan government to build this canal through through Nicaragua. Um, and that canal is, um, the U.S. views that as very important because it's basically going to allow them to trade with Asia um, and to significantly speed up um, intercoastal trade between the Atlantic coast and the Pacific coast. Um, this is all happening kind of right after the California gold rush. 
Um, so Squire travels to uh, Nicaragua as part of this kind of um, diplomatic effort by the U.S. to get the rights to build this canal. So he's sort of sent there as an emissary of U.S. empire. And McCune Smith reads his book and he says, this is just garbage science. It's just really bad. And when we look at Squire's data, his data and his conclusions don't really make any sense. Um, they're, they're sort of out of step with one another. So McCune Smith kind of goes back and combs through the data and says, if all this data is right, it's actually leading you to a very different conclusion. Um, so McCune, so sorry, Squire tries to say that, um, you know, the population in Nicaragua is already overwhelmingly white. So it'd be very easy for us to colonize Nicaragua and sort of um, set up settlements in that area once we build the canal. And then McCune Smith uses the same kind of demographic data to say, actually, this is this data is saying that this country is like 97% people of color. And as a result, um, this would be a really good place for Black people to relocate from the United States to, particularly given the sort of economic futures that were um, able to be envisioned um, from Nicaragua, given that this canal would sort of um, really transform uh, interoceanic trade. What's fascinating, though, is McCune Smith doesn't imagine a kind of Black Republic taking the place of Nicaragua. What he argues instead is that Nicaragua could become this kind of new communipa, um, this sort of multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural community. And he sort of talks about how, um, because of the amount of trade that would be happening in Nicaragua, and because of the kind of topographical diversity, there are all these um, rainforests, and there are rivers, and there are mountains. Um, that people would be coming from all over, people would be developing differently, people would be um, uh, coming from different cultures, speaking different languages, coming in with different ideas from different class backgrounds, and that that kind of diversity is what is necessary for kind of cultivating and progressing civilization long term. And in imagining that sort of utopian project, which of course never actually happens, right? It's kind of strictly this, this kind of utopian fantasy that, that McCune Smith is writing about. But in articulating that, what he sort of exposes is that if Manifest Destiny, as it's being imagined and practiced from the United States, um, were actually to realize its goal of establishing this kind of white hemispheric empire, or at least this hemispheric empire in which white people were always the overwhelming majority, always the ones in position of power, always the ones sort of at the heads of different cultural institutions, that that would end up creating a kind of homogenous culture that would actually have a sliding backwards rather than moving forward, because there would be this sort of, um, this sense of urgency to, um, assimilate and homogenize and have everyone kind of become the same rather than having this kind of constant renewal of culture through the introduction of new people with new ideas um, and sort of new backgrounds and new ways of thinking about things, that that kind of uh, constant rejuvenation is necessary for, for progress. Um, and that becomes a way of sort of exposing that um, Manifest destiny is ultimately pretty short-sighted um, in that sort of long-term, it's not going to be sustainable because it is driven by this impulse toward assimilation and homogenization. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're, you're trained as a literary scholar, and so am I. And uh, I, I thought that you know, it, it was interesting in, in your book, there's a moment where you kind of talk about your methodology and you say, um, although I'm a literary scholar, I'm not really looking at a lot of texts that we typically think of when we think of the literary uh, poems, novels. Um, there is there is one novel that uh, has a sustained discussion, Martin Delaney's uh, 1859 novel, Blake, um, mm -hmm. is, ha, you know, you, you uh, discuss that a bit, but a lot of it is journalism. And um, this uh, this you know writing that kind of comes out of you know describing these 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 potential projects or uh, life writing you know personal narratives um, and 
you, but you say, you know, what really, what makes this literary is the method that you're using. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of just sort of call that out and, and ask us to talk a little bit about um, what you're bringing to this material as a literary scholar. Um, I, I really noticed you spent a, a lot of time with individual texts kind of looking for what is implied in the language through figurative devices, metaphors. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was hoping you could say a little bit more about what it's like studying this material as a literary scholar rather than as a historian. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess the first thing to say is that so much of Black writing before the 1850s is not what we would call literature. Um, it is, there's a lot of life writing, um, what, what Joycelyn Moody calls kind of life writing um, in the African-American tradition. Um, things like Frederick Douglass's narrative, the slave narrative, these kinds of autobiographical texts. There's a lot of political tracks um, and sort of essay writing. Um, there's a lot of writing that's happening in newspapers. Um, and you find some poetry here and there, you find short stories here and there, but the overwhelming amount of writing is happening in genres that are not sort of novels, poetry, fiction, drama, things like that. Um, and uh, Black Studies has really sort of embraced that. So in the study of the, the 19th century that we don't necessarily need to be looking at novels and poetry to be talking about literature and that we can look at some of these other forms of writing that are nevertheless influenced by literature and are drawing on a lot of literary and rhetorical devices that are coming from literature even if their forms are a little bit different. Um, because I think what one of the things that especially political literature is trying to do is diagnose social problems, diagnose political problems, um, to use fiction to kind of work through those in a way that um, history's attachment to facts um, is allows us to do certain kinds of things but literature sort of embrace of um, fiction and imagination and creativity allow us to do other things. So I think by looking at some of these texts, not in a way where I'm sort of taking what they're saying at face value or taking them for sort of factual meaning, but rather looking at the particular turns of phrase, the use of metaphor, um, the use of allegory, the use of allusion, and how these texts um, use a lot of those literary devices to um, expose something or get at something or talk around something um, that they wouldn't be able to otherwise um, through kind of more direct modes of speech. Um, and it's kind of important to keep in mind the, um, the sort of publishing environment at this time, right? Um, even, for, um, even for Black writers who had the kind of um, financial and social support networks that would um, sort of allow them to write things that were a little bit more radical or a little bit more dangerous um, with a still a degree of protection. Um, the, the sort of marketplace of ideas at this time isn't very accommodating to Black radicalism. So metaphor, for instance, a lot and, and um, sort of other kinds of rhetorical devices allow Black writers to say things and to explore things and to kind of prompt people to think through the implications of things in ways that more direct modes of speech wouldn't necessarily allow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another kind of um, approach that I see you taking that I think might uh, come from your, your, your background as a literary scholar are the moments where you, you ask a lot of questions uh, that the historical record doesn't necessarily have, have answers for. Um, mm -hmm. You call this uh, critical fabulations at one point where you just sort of uh, speculate um, on the experience. In this case, it's of uh, the passengers uh, on the boat that uh, took the Reverend Daniel Peterson to, to Liberia. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an account of their voyage and, you know, it gives some details of things that happen. But you, you know, you kind of pick apart these details and ask questions. Um, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, there's 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 an account of a few um, indigent stowaways being among the the passengers of the boat, and you ask, 
Were three of these poor strangers stowaways worried that the spectacle of Penny's heroics would expose them as the difference between the 53 passengers listed on the official manifest. I'm oh, sorry, this is a bad sentence to begin with. Um, did the indigent passengers' faces betray regret, realizing only now, perhaps fatally underprepared, they how fatally underprepared they were for the transatlantic voyage? Or were they attempting to mask their shame when they encountered the impeccably dressed Peterson countenancing them? Did their ragged appearance discomfort their well-dressed counterparts? to nearly recalling the institution they all sought to escape? Did these class divisions give way to solidarity during the 38 days at sea? Did passengers bond over the little bird they caught and released after a storm? The sea turtle they lowered a boat and went after? The gruesome skinning and dressing of a shark Captain Miller harpooned? Or the unusual repast that followed? As they shared stories over the dry meat, did they wonder why sharks swam so eagerly astride their vessel? Or did they know the grim answer? Um, you call them critical fabulations, and it seems like it's a way for you to kind of look beneath what the official account is and ask about what the lived experience is on the boat. Why ask those questions when you don't have a way to answer them? Yeah, so um, so so first of all, you're supposed to say that there are no bad sentences in the book, Gretchen. Yeah. So that was my reading. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm teasing. Um, but um, uh, no, so this idea of critical fabulation comes from um, Sadia Hartman. Um, and Sadia Hartman uses critical fabulation as a sort of Black feminist methodology of accessing the stories of enslaved people that the historical records that we have um, just cannot account for. Um, so in her essay about, in which she sort of coins the term, she's talking about um, uh, th this woman about whom only, um, you know, one or two lines are written in sort of the ship logs um, uh, of, a, um, of a slave ship. Um, and then how do you tell that person's story? And how do you tell that person's story without sort of just creating something out of thin air or without sort of coming up with this romance of what we want to believe about this person. Um, so drawing on, on Hartman's method, what I do is I, I grab what details I can find and then I sort of organize the questions that that leads me to. Um, and by kind of stringing those questions together, you're able to, um, and this is something that Hartman does just absolutely beautifully in her writing is just sort of using questions to still sort of move the story forward without necessarily making any definitive claims. Because to make a definitive claim here would be to say that I know what somebody on a ship going to um, Liberia in the 1850s actually felt or was actually thinking. Um, but what I can do is talk about all of the things that they might have been thinking, all of the things that they might have been worried about, might have been concerned about, might have been working through. And I can show my receipts for why they might have been thinking about those things um, through the kind of archival records that I, that I have access to. Um, but it becomes a way to kind of... Um, illustrate the complexity of this voyage, that this wasn't just 53 people who all were gung-ho about um, going to Liberia and starting a new lives for themselves, starting a new life for themselves. There were there were people in their 80s on that boat. There were young children on that boat. There were people who were single men. There were people who were traveling with their families. They all had different concerns and different things that they might have been excited about or worried about. Um, and I think trying to get to the trying to get at the diversity of experiences and um, and concerns that are shaping that moment and some of the cultural issues that are shaping those concerns, um, it, it's it's a pretty literary method, right? Because it's 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 rooted in creativity. It's rooted in um, you know if you look at critical fabulation, it's the fabulation part of it, right? It's the sort of imaginative, creative part of it. The critical part of it is where it is still rooted in the parts of the record that we do have access to, but also a kind of critical reading of, um, of those records that we do have access to, which 
um, we we know can't tell the whole story. They can, they can't possibly tell the whole story. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing we talked about in um, preparing for this was uh, that it's the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine this year, uh, 1823 mm -hmm. to 2023. And um, the Monroe Doctrine uh, kind of threads through your book, uh, and I've written about it as well. Um, so, uh, you yeah, know, I wanted to kind of ask a question about um, uh, thinking about how your book reflects on where we are today in the U.S., you you end the book actually with with some reflections on this and um, uh, the resurgence of white nationalism in the in the U.S. and how um, sort of a, a a make a make America great again um, a discourse in contemporary U.S. politics actually you know has has connections to um, manifest destiny and the the ethno nationalism that that you see kind of kind of in there. Um, so you know you have some reflections on how manifest destiny you know is sort of still with us today. Um, so I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that, but then also to talk a little bit about the Monroe Doctrine. It comes up in your book because these some of these black intellectual thinkers are interested in other sites in the Americas and and the the idea that the Western hemisphere is sort of destined for democracy and therefore is also destined to be in the sphere of influence of the United States and perhaps under the control of the United States, depending on who's articulating these ideas, um, you know, that that's kind of in the atmosphere of um, a conversation that they're entering into when they're uh, thinking about these, these different sites in the new world and what they could mean for uh, black internationalism and um, you know, as 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 spaces for for emigration or um, resettlement. So, um, yeah. So the question is, uh, thinking about uh, how this how the how you relate this to today, how you saw this the what you were talking about in the book connected to today, and then yeah, maybe particularly thinking about um, uh, at the the two hundredth anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. Is is does manifest destiny matter more? to us today than the Monroe Doctrine does. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, lots of really great questions in there. Um, so just, just to kind of start, so the, the Monroe Doctrine, as it's sort of initially articulated in 1823, is um, it, it's largely about a kind of the U.S. articulating that it's going to take a defensive posture of the hemisphere, right? So it comes kind of right on the heels of all of these um, uh, Spanish American colonies decolonizing and starting to form republics of their own. And, and what, the, what the Monroe Doctrine does is it says, well, this is our sphere of influence um, and the US will sort of defend our interests in the Americas because this is sort of our, our territory, sort of this America for the Americans kind of idea. Um, by the 1840s and 50s, this takes on a little bit more of an aggressive posture where the U.S. then sort of blends the Monroe Doctrine, which sort of articulates this idea that the um, Americas are a distinctive hemisphere unto themselves that are going to be governed, governed by um, democratic republics as opposed to monarchies um, like in Europe. Um, but then that the U.S. has to actually help all of these other um, republics become better republics and can therefore adopt these more kind of aggressive or neo-colonial um, postures toward them. Um, and that's kind of where, where my book picks up in the 1850s. Um, and a lot of those projects have, um, there ends up being kind of a long um, shadow of, of the Monroe Doctrine, um, sort of coextensive with the Cold War, right? We can see elements of the Monroe Doctrine in, um, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Iran-Contra um, scandal, um, you know, we, uh, with the passing of uh, Henry Kissinger, I think we've been recently revisiting a lot of these conversations about um, U.S. foreign policy in the, the 70s and 80s and sort of how aggressively the U.S. was trying to protect its interests within what it saw as its sphere of influence. Um, 
But increasingly today, um, to the extent that we still see that, we're seeing it in sort of, um, you know, questions about military support for Taiwan um, um, against China or for um, Ukraine against Russia. Um, but within the, within the Americas, um, what we see is a kind of evolution of what's really at the heart of the Monroe Doctrine is this idea that the United States and the sort of American experiment and the American project is so great and so important that it needs to be defended at all costs. And I think that that part of the Monroe Doctrine is in some sense still will, with us, although we've seen kind of a modulation of that. Um, the Monroe Doctrine is kind of pushing back against the isolationism of the early Republican period, um, sort of between 1776 and the, the 1820s. And now we're seeing kind of a swing back toward a particular kind of isolationism, particularly with these questions around the US-Mexico border. Um, the current kind of immigration crisis um, and refugee um, uh, and sort of sanctuary seeking crisis at the, um, the US-Mexico border is the result of decades of US foreign policy in Mexico, in Central America, in South America, that have destabilized a lot of these countries, that have destroyed the um, uh, economies of a lot of these countries, and have created conditions where a lot of these countries are dangerous or um, unlivable for a lot of people. Um, and that's sort of resulting in this kind of northern movement um, to the, to the US-Mexico border. Um, but then the project of um, U.S. American uh, exceptionalism and greatness then sort of pivots to this sort of um, need to protect itself that manifests as as isolationism. Um, so I don't know that the the Monroe Doctrine, uh, certainly as it originally appeared, is is still sort of with us and still sort of meaningful um, uh, in terms of today's kind of political debates or questions over foreign policy. But, um, you know, one of the things I argue in the code to the book is that the kind of claims about um, American greatness um, that we are seeing and the sort of uh, lost greatness that we're seeing in um, the MAGA movement and the, the Make America Great Again movement very much have their roots in Manifest Destiny, which is also about kind of getting back to these Anglo-Saxon roots of sort of small local government um, and then sort of uh, realizing this project of unprecedented greatness um, that is uh, in some sense viewed as a kind of a destiny of sorts. Uh, we have an, a question from the audience here, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, do you think that the Afrofuturism movement is a part of the expansion of Manifest Destiny? That's such a great question because yeah, we were just talking about the utopianism that's kind of um, mm -hmm. animating some of the um, you know visions of what what could be and what's possible for a uh, black settlement in in Nicaragua or um, you know even in Martin Delaney's Blake maybe there's some like sort of utopic elements of how this um, this uh, revolution is going to come together um, yeah so uh, what about Afrofuturism I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a really great question, um, because depending on sort of which aspects of Afro Afrofuturism we're talking about, I, I think we could answer the question a, a number of different ways. I think the kind of um, the way that um, this is such a great question, um, and, I, and I'm trying not to just kind of uh, go on a, a long, a long sort of close reading of, of something like Martin Delaney's Blake as an Afrofuturist novel. But I think what you see in a lot of these, um, a lot of these Black writer activists, um, articulations of alternatives to Manifest Destiny are both an appeal to an, um, an Africanist past, um, whether that is um, explicitly making arguments about sort of uh, the history of civilization in Africa, um, uh, where histories of civilization have largely been erased, or whether it's sort of hearkening back to particular um, atavistic aspects of African or diasporic culture. 
Um, but then there's also always this kind of utopian future looking aspect of it, um, where it's kind of about bridging the the past and the future, which I, is something I see as really critical to, to Afrofuturist literature. Um, I also think that what a lot of, um, particularly some of the more science fiction leaning Afrofuturist literature is doing is really sort of embracing this speculative mode, sort of of imagining the world otherwise, um, of imagining um, not only Earth, but the universe in, in, in ways other than what we currently know it to be. And I think that kind of um, imaginative speculative register is a really important part of how Black intellectuals in the mid 19th century are thinking about um, manifest destiny and thinking about the future of the Americas. Um, I think there's there's more to say also about how a lot of, um, again, particularly science fiction and particularly kind of space oriented um, Afrofuturist fiction um, addresses the problem of colonization um, and sort of it raises these questions about colonizing other worlds um, in ways that I think feel um, feel rooted in some of these critiques of manifest destiny that even as you're imagining something else um if you're imagining something else somewhere else there might already be people there and you need to kind of figure out what your relationship to those people is going to be and you can either adopt a really um uh chauvinistic view towards those people or um or perhaps other dispositions um mm -hmm. so i think that particularly when i think about the the science fiction um sort of segment of, of afrofuturism that starts to get get really interesting. Yeah, I'm thinking um, about Octavia Butler's Dawn, right, right. where we have, uh, you know, sort of an alien race that is uh, quite determined that it's that it's correct in sort of um, genetically altering and uh, taking away the choice making abilities of the, the humans that they're encountering. Um, but mm -hmm. a book I actually thought a lot about when I was uh, reading parts of your book was Nisi Shaw's Everfair which is kind of like a steampunk retelling of um, the Belgian uh, decolonization of the Congo. And there are uh, US, US American, African Americans. Uh, there are um, uh, 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 British folks who are, who are there. Um, and then there are um, uh, indigenous uh, African folks who are there and they're sort of all Sort of mixed up in this this uh, pretty fantastical plot where there's also like you know um, you know uh, flying bicycles and you know things like that. So um, thinking about uh, you know really using counterfactuals to reimagine what a, a black international uh, vision and a utopian vision could look like. Um, so a couple of book recommendations there for anyone interested in the Afrofuturism afterlife of uh, Black internationalism and manifest destiny. Well, I think we're getting close to the end here. I just want to see, you know, is there any, you know, what was your what was your favorite part of researching this book? Oh, gosh. Um, there were so many parts of this book that were really energizing for me. Um, I think the the part that I had the most fun writing um, was definitely the chapter on Canada, um, because in the chapter on the U.S.-Canada borderlands, um, I really get into the relationship between um, uh, these two different Black activ activists, so Henry Bibb and his wife Mary Bibb, and then um, the Black activist Mary Ann Chad Carey, um, and these kinds of deep principled ideological and political disagreements between these sort of two different camps and the, these two different sort of um, individuals and the, the ideas that they represent. Um, and there's just lots of really great um, sort of back and forth between them that were really kind of um, spicy to read, like they, they really kind of go after each other in different ways. Um, but I think that was also exciting for me because um, as much as they were in disagreement with one another, they were both living in Ontario um, in the 1850s and really trying to think critically about how they could build something new from the ground up, um, how they could actually build community among Black exiles and refugees and fugitives from slavery 
um, who were living in Canada at that time. And um, their ideas go off in a number of different directions, but it was really exciting to see, um, see them looking at kind of practical details of what this would look like. And that felt meaningfully different from a lot of the other places in the book where um, we are dealing a lot more with kind of speculative modes or sort of big picture imaginations of the relationships between different nations. And here it was really granular. It was like, um, you know, how are we going to figure out how to buy land or distribute land or um, what kinds of crops should we be growing or, um, you know, should we have integrated um, schools or should we have separate schools for, for Black people um, where we can educate ourselves? And these these were, I thought, all, um, it, it was a level of detail that I hadn't seen um, in a lot of other places. And I think that was really exciting for me. That's great. Um, all right. Well, I think, I think we may be ready to uh, wrap up and I just want to thank you for talking with me today and yeah, recommend, recommend that people uh, go ahead and get yourself a copy of the race for the Americas. Um, thanks so much, RJ. Thank you so much, Gretchen. I really appreciated it. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.